Again, and welcome to another edition of Public Affairs Public Access. Uh, I'm your guest host, David Hutzelman, and we're pleased to bring you another uh, topic and lively panel discussion about topics that are important to Houstonians, usually from a libertarian or classical liberal perspective, although uh, tonight we're tackling a, a, a problem that uh, probably doesn't have a whole lot of partisan uh, uh, divisions associated with it, and it's the topic of flooding and flooding in the Houston and Harris County area. And I have uh, three gentlemen here tonight who are well familiar with the topic and are giving their maybe slightly different approaches as to what uh, the solution to the flooding is, but nonetheless we'll have a lively discussion about what uh, some of the public policy options might be and we invite you to stay with us for the next hour. And uh, if you'd like to call in, we're going to have a call in number on the phone on the uh, screen. And you can call in and ask these panelists uh, a question about that as well. So on my far left here, we have uh, Barry Klein. Barry is the uh, president and founder of the Houston Property Rights Association. Very uh, in, uh, oriented towards property rights and how property rights and flooding interact, and I'm sure he's going to tell us about that today. And to his uh, right is uh, Don Hooper. Don's a spokesperson for the uh, Houston Conservative Forum, and he has uh, been a blogger and a uh, participant in a lot of public policy discussions and to, with the Houston Chronicle for another, uh, uh, another one of his outlets. And on my immediate left is Jim Notaware, uh, president of Notaware Advisors, and a public policy advocate who has been, actually was a public director of public housing for Houston yes, some years yes. in the past. So he's well familiar with the uh, political uh, environment. And we're all here to talk about uh, flooding and what, if anything, can be done about it. And uh, we have one here, Jim here, his house is actually flooded. So he's... Uh, not a uh, uninterested bystander in this uh, conversation, <laughs> and uh, and he's uh, well aware of what the impact of this is. But uh, so I'm going to start the uh, program off with a short uh, summary from each of these uh, panelists about what their uh, particular perspective on flooding is, and. Uh, We'll start with Barry, who has a very uh, free market libertarian perspective on flooding and the dangers posed by flooding, and uh, give him uh, two minutes to tell us, Barry, what uh, main thrust you have on the flooding issue. Mm. <clears throat> well, as the president of the Houston uh, Property Rights Association, I'm always interested in, in seeing the problem from a free market property rights Good. perspective and seeing what we can do to look at the problem that's before us and how we can preserve property rights in the, in the uh, policy discussion and changes that may come. So looking at the flooding problem, the first thing I, I keep in mind is that every flood is different. There's no way to predict where the flood is going to be next time. <clears throat> and I've come to learn that there's actually no reliability in the, in the flood maps that are produced by FEMA with help from local flood-related agencies. No reliability whatsoever. They don't update them. You're talking <laughs> about the 100-year versus 500-year floodplain kind of they're, issues? They're all untrustworthy. Uh, uh, keep in mind that we have, a, <clears throat> we have a, a world which is 4 billion years old. Uh, we have a, uh, our, our, our largest uh, bayou, Buffalo Bayou, is 18,000 years old, experts tell me, give, give or take a decade. And we have less than 200 years of data on, 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 on rain experiences, on, on rain events. So we have very little data on what the, the world is likely to bring us in terms of future flooding. Every time we have a hurricane, the rain bands are going to be different. There's no predicting. So people need to take steps to protect themselves, and they can. There's things you can do to protect yourself from flooding. First thing to do is keep the topography in mind and pick a high point or a point on the, on the gradient so you're close to the top of one of the high points between the bayous. We've got uh, 22 bayous in Harris County. So that's the first step. 
you can also make sure your, your house is elevated on pier and beam. The house I live in is on pier and beam. I had no serious problems during Harvey. Um, you can also uh, flood proof your home. You can take steps to put up flood gates at your doors, put in, so get some flood bags to put it at the base so water, no water sneaks through. Have a small pump inside for any water that does get in. And for, the, for two or three feet of, of water, that will give you a, a high measure of protection. Every household should also have a family dinghy in the back, or maybe a, an inflatable one in the in the in a, in a closet to pull out in case things uh, do go bad for you. So those are the things you can do to protect yourself from flooding. The government's rules and regulations and new taxes they're proposing will not protect you, and that's uh, that's my free market property rights message to start this conversation. Okay. Don, you want to? Uh summarize what your uh, take on the flooding issue is so we can uh, sure I, conversation. Yeah, I don't disagree with anything that Barry said I you know B Barry's right as far as you know we should let the market take care of this but my perspective is a little bit different I uh, was the president of the Brazewood Place Homeowners Association during tropical storm Allison which you know was featured over that geographic area and I had 545 homes flood in my neighborhood I thought that there was an answer, and I sought a, a quest to find an answer to the flooding problem, and there really isn't one. I mean, I, I you know, ran across some of the best hydrologist engineers in the city, and, all, and I learned that all flooding is very local. Every person's house is different, you know, with respect of how it's going to flood or when it's going to flood, if it floods at all. And, it has a broad range of effects for different neighborhoods. If you look at Meyerland, at the reason why it floods, it's very different than why Brazewood Place floods. Um, the heights where Barry lives is very different from uh, Jim's neighborhood where he flooded. Mm -hmm. And there's all different little aspects and it's a very, very complicated issue. It is not a simple issue. And hydrologists can spend their entire lives studying our different um, watersheds and so um, it's a complicated uh, problem and no easy solution to it and I do think that Barry's right in the aspect that we have been misled by some of our government officials as to uh, what is safe and not safe I don't think that uh, there will be parts of Meyer land and Brazewood Place that people should not live in anymore it's always going to flood unless they're going to do extreme lifting of their homes but uh, it's uh, 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 a very interesting time, and of course, we have the two and a half billion dollar uh, county bond proposal that is staring us. That's scheduled for uh, August twenty fifth. Okay, very good. Jim, Dr. Weigh in on uh, your uh, take on this. Thank you, David. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the first thing I want to do is agree with one of your opening statements. <clears throat> which is uh, this is not a partisan issue by any means, and I hope it's not a political issue. I, I hope it is a series of technical issues that people will address in order to um, do everything we collectively can to keep future flooding and the damage from it um, to a minimum. As the water was coming up in my home and my neighbor's homes, um, it didn't matter whether uh, I was a Democrat or a Republican. <laughs> it didn't matter. It, every, it hit everyone indiscriminately. And as we look forward, uh, because uh, our home flooded, I've become a student of what has happened. And as we look forward, I'm reminded of the old adage, those who forget the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. So let's try to look at what has actually happened before we run around and spend huge amounts of money um, without really understanding fully where we're going. And uh, by that, I mean that there's no question that we in metropolitan Houston, the whole southeast uh, Texas Gulf Coast region, received a huge amount of rain, unprecedented and really unpredicted uh, level of rain. But I posit that most of the damage from the rain was caused by human error. Not just because of what happened when the rain fell, 
but most importantly, what the preparation or lack of it from uh, the rain itself. Uh, we failed to heed the lessons of what happened in New Orleans. We failed to take advantage of our own responsibilities. And we put our faith in a number of people and government institutions that frankly weren't worthy of our trust. There was a wonderful article about three weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal by one of my favorite columnists, Peggy Noonan, who said, we are losing faith in the institutions that support us and the leadership of those institutions. And I think we need to look very carefully, very seriously, and very diligently um, about the institutions that uh, ostensibly provide us with protection from the floods going forward. And I would start with questioning the city of Houston and its, quote, rain tax that was intended to protect the citizens of Houston from flooding in the future when it was passed and collection started, ten, uh, excuse me, in 2010. And I how has ask, that been used since it's uh, been employed? A, how has it been used? And B, can anyone point to projects that were completed between 2010 and 2017 that actually mitigated damage from the Harvey uh, rainstorm and the Harvey flood. I have not seen any publicity about what had actually happened. Okay. So well, I'd be happy yeah. to get into this All in right. detail. And, <clears throat> would, uh, would I be uh, thank you for the invitation. fair in uh, characterizing your uh, position on the rain tax as it was basically a bait and switch operation? It was a bait and switch operation and it was uh, uh, the tax itself um, was authorized by a ballot which has been deemed to be inappropriate by a unanimous verdict of the Texas Supreme Court. But despite that, the city continues to collect approximately $125 million per year. And uh, I'd like to know what we're getting for our money. Okay. Well, you're getting some, some road repair is what you're getting in part because uh, probably the, the best student on what's gone wrong with the rain tax concept and they call it Rebuilding Houston. That's the name they gave the program. <clears throat> and a lot has gone, gone into road work. And as Bill King points out in his articles, his blog posts, it's, it, there's no way a taxpayer can look at what they, what they describe in the budget and figure out exactly how much went to flood control and how much went to roads. But in any event, the majority of that money has been diverted to other parts of the city budget. And so it really has been a fraud on the taxpayer What's regrettable is that very few people have the wish or the money to sue to try and make that right. And uh, I know one fellow who's been suing the city since 2004, trying to get them to honor a, a, a proposition I work with him on to limit the growth in taxes, and that is still unresolved in the courts. It can take many, many years and hundreds of thousands of dollars and try and make the government do what it's supposed to do under Texas law. Okay, well, let's uh, move on. Uh, I think as uh, actually since I've heard someone uh, quote Bill King, he says uh, when uh, when you hear people uh, going around the city uh, saying somebody should do something, uh, it's generally results in some bad public policy. So uh, I think that may be the, <clears throat> the conclusion of our panelists here. But of course, the city of Houston and the, the county, Harris County, have come up with doing something. And of course, in city of Houston, they have passed, I guess, some uh, land use restrictions having to do with the 500 year floodplain and where you can build and what you have to do if you're going to build in those areas and so forth. And of course, the county now has a $2.5 billion bond issue. And you can look at, I think, the Chronicle last week or the week before had a pretty exhaustive um, page of all the different projects that they were going to fund to supposedly uh, control flooding in some way or other. But uh, Barry, let's go back to you and, and see what your specific uh, criticisms are of both the city uh, perspective and uh, what the county might be doing with their bond. Well, the city has adopted a rule that we're no, we're no longer going to rely on the 100-year floodplain. We're now going to use a 500-year floodplain, and the rule will be you have to put your house two feet above the surface of the earth at that point. Or and you I, can't build? Is that the deal? I mean, you have to... Unless you... Well, you, you don't build, get a building you permit unless... You have to have your structure two feet above the surface. 
if you're in that 500-year floodplain. Now, what Bill King points out is that <clears throat> you, can, you can be flooded even though you, the water did not leave the banks of a nearby bayou because there's a problem with, with what's called sheet flooding. You get a, a heavy uh, downpouring of rain and the water then starts finding a way to get to a low point, the bayou, and it can flood homes in the, in the pathway. But that is not calculated in the 100-year or the 500-year floodplain. <laughs> and, and I think in the case of uh, Sims Bayou, uh, uh, you know, and thousands of homes were flooded during Harvey and the water never left Sims Bayou. It was, it was all sheet flooding. But I want to point out that this, is, this plan of the county, the $2.5 billion, is only about one-tenth of what they say they need. They say they need $25 billion worth of flood work to protect the county from flooding. But that's only based on the 100-year floodplain, the one the, the, the metric they say is entirely untrustworthy and unreliable, and they should not be relying on it. <clears throat> so it's all very deceptive on the part when they, they don't come to the public. Now they will tell you, this is the fact sheet that the county puts out explaining what they have in mind for the $2.5 billion project or program. But in the small print, they tell you it's only tied to the 100-year floodplain. So obviously you're getting almost nothing in terms of flood protection after you spent $25 billion. But most of us won't be living by the time they, they get to that point. It's a 15-year uh, plan to spend the $2.5 billion. They're assuming there'll be some other money coming in from other levels of government, such as the Fed. So let's assume <clears throat> they get an equal amount, which probably won't happen. <clears throat> so that's $5 billion over 15 years, and that's about one-fifth of what they say they need to get us to protect us from a 100-year floodplain. So that should raise the question in any thoughtful taxpayer's mind, why are we doing this? If there's no significant protection for flooding, and it's not going to happen in my lifetime or before I retire and leave the county, then why should I put up with this tax hike that they're promising me? Why don't I do look for another way to protect myself from flooding? That, that would be, I think, my, my point of view on that. Okay. One of the uh, issues I saw in terms of the building restrictions and so forth is that whatever the current map is for the 100-year floodplain or something, that many of the areas that have come in under these restrictions were never even flooded, haven't flooded in the last three major flooding events. I think uh, Bill King was mentioning something like Kashmir Gardens that mm -hmm. said there's areas in there that have never flooded, and yet now they've been put under these onerous uh, building restrictions in terms of uh, retail well, well, the city, uh, development. Yeah. So, Don, yeah, let me turn it over to you and see what you have. Yeah, so the city of Houston, in its infinite wisdom, decided to you know, whether than, rather than wait for the Harris County, because the city <clears throat> only controls the water in their streets. The Harris County Flood Control District is responsible for the bios that the streets flow into. And the city, in a quest to get around government, federal government regulation having to do with the um, uh, flood control or the flood maps, sought to create a way for home builders and developers to continue to build. And that was what you saw in the ordinance. Now, the problem is going to be that we're going to have to redo, and so they arbitrarily said the 500 year, the city said the 500 year uh, floodplain is gonna be the new baseline for, and you gotta be two feet above that. Which was interesting, but it didn't have anything to do with the the realm of what happened with Harvey, which you know is scheduled to be analyzed and um, developed based on what was considered the Atlas 14 report that has been generated by NOAA to uh, to create the new flood maps, and that'll be a long process. It'll be one to two years, and um, it could be as long as three years. The county is seeking to take a portion of the money that they get from the two and a half billion dollars and upfront the money for the Army Corps to complete the maps. And the, the, the theory there is, is that they didn't want to wait for the feds to do it because it took an awfully long time to get it done after Tropical Storm Allison. And the city was smaller. It was when Allison happened. We, we now have all this development out on the west side. People, places flooded during Harvey that never flooded before. And I remember my wife going, did those places flood before? And I said, 
Yeah, probably, but nobody lived there. So, you know, it, it, you know, we didn't, you know, there was no basis of knowledge of a lot of these areas and a lot of these new subdivisions that flooded. But I'll, I'll caution everybody to think about flooding this way. If Jim Noteware or Barry Klein or yourself, you know, had $3 million and you wanted to go build a nice house over in Memorial and you had a big lot, say you had an acre lot and you built your home. First rain comes along and you notice some ponding that's sitting on your property. Um, you're going to want to drain that off and you're not gonna wanna have water standing on your property. If you think about that in every single person that lives in Harris County, that's the reason why uh, water is sheet flowing so fast into our bios. And I'm not sure that there's an answer for that. I don't. I think everybody's going to want to drain their properties, whether they're commercial properties or residential properties. Business owners don't want water standing on their property either. And it, it's a very, very complicated problem. Now, originally, I was opposed to the bond. And I met with the county judge, and we had a very long discussion, just he and I personally, to discuss what, you know, he you know, his thinking was about it. And I told him my big concern was I didn't want Stephen Costello and the people that initiated the rain tax to steal all the money and the engineers that were involved with all, you know, the city of Houston rain tax to um, be the people running the county initiative. And he assured me that that was not going to happen. But the other thing that really concerned me, and I'd heard rumors about it, but it has been confirmed to me now by city officials and the county judge that Mayor Turner had intended to put the rain tax back on the November ballot. And I don't think it's a good idea to confuse voters between the bad apples at the city of Houston on the rain tax versus what the county's attempting to do with their flood control projects. And for the most part, the county has been a good steward of tax dollars. They have been able to execute uh, projects uh, on time and under budget for the most part on most of their construction projects with related to the Harris County Flood Control District. And it's night and day compared to the city. And the other thing that kind of changed my mind, it, and I had been thinking about it, you know, because we'd all have been talking about opposing it, uh, the bond, was that people that live in Meyerland, people that live in Braisewood Place, people uh, that have been repeatedly flooded in Kingwood and along the San Jacinto River, need relief and the only way we're going to have the flexibility to get them to relief and buy them out of their homes is to sell this bond issue. If we wait for the feds to do it, we're going to be waiting 10 floods down the road and we'll constantly be rebuilding these homes. What is the, what was the rationale? I'm, you mentioned something about putting the rain tax back on the ballot. Well, why would so, you want to put it back? Well, on well Jim, Jim mentioned it, and so, and that's the reason why I brought that up. But yeah, so the to Texas validate it locally. Yes, yeah, so that's the, what they're trying. Yeah, to do. so the Texas Supreme Court ruled the ballot language originally for the rain tax was misleading, and that had been litigated by some of our friends and uh, very costly. But they were successful in getting the Texas Supreme Court to say, yeah, the ballot language was misleading. You didn't tell people that you were going to raise their taxes to. Um, or actually it was became a fee in fee. big de debate of whether it was a fee or a tax, it's a tax. And um, the Texas Supreme Court ruled the language invalid and basically is forcing the city to put it back to the voters. Okay. And so, so, so Sylvester Turner thought, oh, well, I'll just put it up there with the um, Harris, County, Harris County bond. And I think that that was a... Um, uh, calculated decision on his part, smart, you know, for him, bad for us because the people that are desperate to get something done and their homes flooded and their neighbors' homes flooded because I think, and I may have this number wrong, but it's close, 136,000 structures, homes, residential homes flooded during Harvey. And that's a lot of people. Everybody was impacted. Everybody, now I know I, Jim's home was flooded. My home wasn't flooded. I tell people all the time I live in a high rise in downtown Houston. If my home floods, the ark has passed me by. The, uh, <laughs> it's passed everybody by. 
Uh, but the bottom line is, I you know I had friends in Braisewood Place. I spent days, weeks cutting uh, sheetrock out of their homes and uh, during Tropical Storm Allison, and I just did it again for Harvey. And you know people need relief, and I want to see them get it. Okay, Jim, you want to comment on those two? <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to. Um, both Barry and Don have said some very very important things. Um, most or almost all of which I, uh, I, I agree with, and starting with uh, Don's conclusion about respecting uh, County Judge Ed Emmett and the position he's taking. I have a, a lot of respect for uh, County Judge Emmett, and I like very much the fact that he is proposing doing something. I want very much to do something. I want that very much to be the right thing or the set of things. Uh, I believe that the the first responsibility of government officials is to keep us safe. The federal government defines that with diplomacy and military power. Local governments tend to define that with uh, police and fire protection. I would argue that flood protection ranks right up there um, with all those other responsibilities. The other thing, listening to both Barry and to Don, um, they didn't say it in so many ways, but if you listen carefully, they've articulated one of the flaws in the way that we are approaching things, not just flooding, but virtually everything we do uh, when it comes to government. Our government is fractured. It's one thing to have levels of government, federal, state, local, and sometimes intermediate areas, um, institutions like the Houston Galveston Area Council, which distributes money for the federal government to um, local, uh, local municipalities. So you have not just three, but oftentimes more. When storm clouds gather or rain falls, they don't see, the raindrops don't see political subdivisions. And one of the things that happens is Harris County is a drainage solution for both Montgomery and Fort Bend counties, okay? So we can plan all we want for our own rainfall, but unless and until our neighbors to the west and south and north are part of our own discussion, we're going to be done unto when the rains fall. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a whole history in Harris County of the county and the city not getting along on virtually anything, okay? And so why are we as taxpayers and voters, we vote for county officials and we vote for city officials and somehow when they get into office, they choose not to deal with each other and we're held in the balance. Can't we figure out how to take an up periscope type view and plan together, invest together, and result together. Um, just one thing that I think we, we really need to think about how we actually do things. I see Barry. Uh, yeah, but I like the comment, yeah, one of your points about <clears throat> we become the repository for the rain that, that falls in Montgomery County and in part, I guess, uh, Fort Bend County. Though they know a big river there that helps them drain. <clears throat> but only about 10% of the, of the homes in in the Houston area flooded during Harvey, in spite of all the publicity uh, and, the, and the negative elf, uh, effects of that storm, uh, only about 10% of the houses actually suffered any flood damage. So it, it does tend to get exaggerated. The, and the county has actually been un, unreliable in terms of, of alerting us to the risks that we're facing from flooding. You know, we've got two dams and I think we already know now that originally in the 40s when they built uh, Barker and Attic's Dam, there was a third dam mm -hmm. planned <clears throat> about where uh, Jersey Village is today. And uh, so they only had two thirds of the plan finished. And one reason we went through all the, the, the worst effects of Harvey in that part of the county was because there was no third levee or dam to hold the waters. Mm -hmm. The county did not tell us that that plan was only two-thirds finished. Mm -hmm. They acted for years like they had a very successful flood protection mechanism in place. Mm -hmm. So they were withholding key information that we would have wanted to know about. Well, of course, now Jersey Village is where that, that third levy would have gone. There's talk now about spending, I think, six or seven hundred million dollars to build a, a new levy. You may know that number, Don. <clears throat> but that's in a different part of the county that won't be protecting existing structures, it'll be protecting raw land that is going to open it up for new development. 
So the developers who typically give money to office holders will be rewarded uh, if the taxpayers come up with $700 million to build a new levy. But my, my central point here is that the county has not been reliable in this matter. We're at greater risk than we realize, and they're not really making it clear that all these billions of dollars they want to spend will only give us protection from the 100-year flood event, which we all know is, is an unreliable metric. So I don't have any confidence in the city, and I don't have any confidence in the county. I think people need to rely on their own instincts, do, uh, do what they do in most parts of their lives, practice coffee out emptor, make a sound decision about where to find that, a safe location to build or buy, and take other steps to protect themselves if they find themselves with rising water. You know, Barry, it's very interesting to listen to you because what you said is there's, in effect, a false sense of security. The false sense of security, by, uh, which is preached directly and indirectly, uh, explicitly and implicitly by our elected officials, the definition of uh, moral hazard, when you cut it all apart, is a false sense of security, right? Whether it was the financial crisis 10 years ago or now flooding, et cetera. So, um, what can we do to actually um, make things better? Uh, first, I think we have to challenge conventional wisdom and status quo. Let's go back to the flood maps that you spoke about earlier in this conversation. If you were a young MD getting his degree, his or her degree, and about ready to take the medical exam and get your license, uh, you would be asked to take what's known as the Hippocratic Oath. Mm -hmm. It is a very long document, but in summary, it says, first, do no harm. I posit part of my uh, human error discussion is that those flood maps that were in place over the last 10 or 15 years did not warn people where they were living. They did not warn people or their insurance companies with adequate information or data or ultimately protection about what actual risks were. And therefore, I think they did more harm than good. Now, we are rushing to get new floodplain maps out. Have they been double checked? No, they're, they're not actually rushing. <laughs> it's a very slow process. Well, it's a very slow process. And it's interesting, today is June 28th. Tomorrow will be June 29th. August 29th, 10 months ago, is when the Army Corps of Engineers chose to release the, uh, uh, the water in the, uh, in the yeah, attic marker, marker dams. Yeah. Um, we flooded two days earlier, so we had nothing to do with that decision. Uh, we had other problems. But it's interesting, what has been done in 10 months? I can tell you by looking out at Buffalo Bayou um, near my home, it is still full of trees oh. and debris and everything else. When do our officials actually take responsibility and accountability for doing what they are charged with doing? Well, what I hear them saying is that we're, we're, we're going to do things differently in the future, but in fact, they're doing things exactly as they did them in, in the past. Mm -hmm. They have a computer model which projects uh, future flooding, and they have old maps, uh, the ones we we're currently dealing with, go back 50 years in some cases, and they also delay implementing the new maps because that means some people who are not today in a flood plain or will be in a flood plain, which means that their insurance costs will go up because now they have to buy the federal flood insurance, which is costly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the whole system can deceive the homeowner, and people need to become wary of, of uh, just take steps to protect themselves with full knowledge of, of past flood events, where they, where they sit on the topography or on the high point, a low point, or in between, and then make a judgment call about what they're willing to accept in terms of risk. I've been reading in the paper about resiliency, and what's interesting is that my land is bouncing back. Uh, people are, are fixing up their homes, they're elevating some homes, other people are, are buying flooded homes. They're saying that was a, an outlier event, so Harvey won't happen again, so I'm happy to live here. There's a good school district nearby. I want my kid in that school. I want to stay in that school district. So my land is, is coming back. 
But I also have read in the paper where one person said, I'm going to live in my land because I see that money being spent on raised bio. That's going to protect me in the future. They don't realize that the county's plan is only based on protecting them from a 100-year flood event, which is no protection at all. It's yeah, a, Don, it, you had to, I know one of your early, <clears throat> one of your earlier uh, critiques of the uh, plan was, how can you uh, put in place something to mitigate a 100-year flood or a 500-year flood plan? Well, that, we it, don't even know what it is. Well, that, <laughs> that, that was the first thing I said to Judge Emmett when I met with him. I said, Judge, my problem is, is after Allison, and I sat on the Tropical Storm Allison Task Force, was that we had to redefine the 100-year and 500-year floodplains. And until we did that, there was no way to measure, because I lived in Braisewood Place, what the improvements to the uh, Braise Bio were going to do in relation to lowering the floodplain in relation to everybody's home. Well, Harvey's the same way. Until we can establish what the new 100 or 500 year plane is, we're not going to know. However, after that experience, I knew that it was a very long time before we, and Houston has grown, the county has grown significantly. We've, had, we've got areas, and flooding is so unique. Every neighborhood, every home floods for a different reason. It's very complicated. And we need, I mean, I, if we wait for the federal government to solve this problem, we're going to be waiting, you know, uh, it, it'll be like the immigration issue. It'll never get solved. And um, I think by doing that, and I, I'll, I should say that I was in the commissioner's court when uh, Russ Poppy, who is the new head of the Harris County Flood Control District, because I wanted to see what day they were going to vote. The Harris County Republican Party had um, made it very clear that they wanted to have these bond elections, and this is the largest one the county's ever issued, um, on uniform election days in November, not on off days that it's scheduled with August. And I just previously talked about why I think the thing, Judge Emmett is correct to hold it on that August flood date, not to confuse it with the city rain tax. But the bottom line is, is that Mr. Poppy spoke and I will never forget, and I was sitting from here to, you know, that wall right there from him, and I looked him in the face when the commissioners, you know, asked him, and they said, you know, you know, can, do you have the projects in line to do this? And he kind of straightened out his coat, and he goes, uh, you know, currently we're doing about $60 million worth of projects a year for the Harris County Flood Control District. You're talking about taking my department and increasing it by a factor of 10, which is big. It's huge. And he goes, we can come up with projects that will reduce flooding. But he pointed out all the things that we've already talked about, about the new flood maps and, and uh, uh, everything else. But he was tasked with coming up with a, a group of projects, which are the meetings that they are holding in all the different areas. The reason why Kingwood flooded is very different than the reason why Braisewood Place and Meyerland flooded. The reason why Katy flooded and Memorial flooded is very different from one, the reasons why Kingwood flooded. Flooding is very unique and local, and, and truthfully, most of Kingwood is uh, controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers, not the Harris County Flood Control District, because that's the San Jacinto River, which is a whole other problem. But if we don't sell the two and a half billion dollar bonds, um, we're not going to have the flexibility in working around the government. Now, they're not going to sell all two and a half billion dollars at once. It's going to be, you know, sold in increments That's over a 10 to 15 year period. And the argument has been made that, that because of rising property values, we won't see a tax increase. And if we do, it'll be minimal. You know, I want to hear more from the finance director. I know he's coming to speak to Barry's group. I encourage everybody to come out to Barry's group, the Houston Property Rights Association, and listen to Mr. Jackson talk about that. But I'm fairly convinced that we need the flexibility with that $2.5 billion authorization to buy people out of their homes, to get these immediate projects that they know are, you know, bottling water up and get, get them done, to clean out the bios, to 
to uh, create the, the culverts and the improvements that they know that they will immediately do it. Are, they, are we going to be able to measure it against the new 100 and, uh, 500 year plane before people vote on the bond? No, we're not. And that's a sad fact. And what, <clears throat> what about the issues of uh, the proverbial unintended consequences of building flood protection? Don't you just force that water to go somewhere else where <laughs> people didn't think there was needed <laughs> flood protection? You know, so, so it's interesting. And whenever we have a big flood, you learn something. And, I, and, and what Harvey taught me, and I didn't realize that water, you know, I always thought water moved from north to south to Galveston Bay. It does not. It goes from west, west to east to the San Jacinto River. Oh. And so there's all these little unique bottlenecks. And the Harris County Flood Control District has done a pretty good job at analyzing those over several floods that we've had with Memorial and Tax Day. So they know some of those projects that need to be done. But until we can get those major studies done, we're not going to know the big projects. But the, the bond, I think, is the intent to give the county flexibility in dealing with the state of Texas. That's The governor has talked about building the third reservoir, which is the dam that Barry's talking about, and uh, that cannot be done until 2019. By the Even if we used the um, uh, uh, rainy day fund by the state of Texas, we still couldn't get to it until 2019 because the budget is done in two-year increments from the state of Texas. Uh, we just need that flexibility. I don't think that they will ever spend two and a half billion dollars. I think a lot of this money is going to be reimbursed by the federal government. There's a lot of it that is um, uh, right now proposed matching grants. And so for every hundred million we spend, we get 300 million from the feds. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's the flexibility we need. And qu quite frankly, I just trust the county government much more than I do the city government. <laughs> okay. Jim, want to yeah, may I wait in on that? Yeah, of course, of course. First, I'd like to respond to something that Barry said, which is the observation about resiliency. And he made the comment about the uh, recovery of the Houston uh, real estate market and uh, really talked about economic resiliency. And that's absolutely fine. I think all of us, particularly those of us in the real estate business, are very, very pleased with that. However, <clears throat> Um, there's a, another old adage called the generals always fight the last war. Everything we've been talking about since Harvey 10 months ago is rebuilding to plan for another Harvey. Harvey was, by everybody's definition, a very unique event. We know from living on the Texas Gulf Coast that there will be a series of natural disasters. We can't predict when they will occur and we can't predict what they are or will be. Hurricane Ike was completely different than Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Allison was completely different than either of them. When we talk about resiliency, shouldn't we diversify what we're protecting ourselves against instead of just focusing everything on trying to replicate Harvey? One of the lessons I've learned in dealing with other people who flooded, including uh, the people who have helped my family and me recover, is that the entire system is set up to put everything back the way it once was for everybody to go rebuild their homes, for everybody to buy the same kind of insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Seems to me that the best protection is to take a step back and say, maybe we should think about doing it a different way. Maybe we have an opportunity like in golf with a mulligan, a do-over. Let's take a step back. Maybe the best protection is not to live where you live. Maybe the best protection is to have a different form of government or decision making. Maybe the best protection is a different kind of A, capital investment, and B, uh, management. I'm in the real estate business, and anybody who's in the real estate business knows that it's a very capital intensive business. If you want to develop a piece of property, you have to raise capital. When you go talk to your local banker or an investment banker, or institutional investor on Wall Street, the very first thing they look at, the very first thing, isn't the project. It's not even the market, and it's not even the construction. It is the quality of the sponsorship. Who is going to lead the project? 
what are their credentials, what is their experience with success, et cetera. Now, Don, when you tell me about what Mr. Poppy said about in order to undertake just the two and a half billion, not the 25 to 35 that Barry was talking about, he has to increase his organization tenfold. That, I'm tempted to say it's frightening. I won't say it's frightening, but I will say it's a very important warning. Oh, it is. There's no question it is. I think they're going to have to really bring in some very smart construction people to get involved with the project. But, and I have a certain amount of confidence until they prove me wrong. I think that they have executed pretty well on the Braves project. The reason why the Braves project is stalled right now is because of the improvements that the city won't do, of course. But the, um, and when I'm talking about it, are the bridges from the 610 loop to the ship channel. Yeah. But the, the bottom line, and something that we haven't talked about and I think we need to talk about, there's a lot of litigation going on. We have, we have the flood czar out there who is going to, um, who has been sued. Uh, this is Mr. Steve, Costello we're Steven, talking about? Stephen Costello, who uh, uh, initiated the rain tax. And Mr. Costello is going to have to sit in a room with some of the meanest plaintiff's lawyers known to man and answer some very difficult questions about his decision making, which will all help us in our decision making, because he's not going to be able to lie. In the, in the, and I'm really curious, and actually Lise Olson from the Chronicle has written some really good articles talking about some of this and some of the, you know, the problems that, that, that happened um, uh, with uh, Mr. Costello's projects that he had worked on that flooded very badly in Fort Bend County. Uh, I don't, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of a lawsuit he has here in Harris County, but the, uh, re but related to Harvey, uh, the Riverstone project that he did for the Johnson Development Corporation, mm -hmm. and there's about 1,400 residents, I believe, that flooded over there that is all under litigation. So a lot of these questions that we're talking about are going to be dwelled into by some very, very talented plaintiff's lawyers, and we're going to get some good answers from our engineering community about the decisions that they made. And I think it's going to be fascinating. I think it's going to be interesting. And I think we're going to learn a lot from it. I think you're right. It's going to take a while, however. Yep. And there's, there's a plus and a minus to that that I see. When it comes to government, whether it's flooding or housing or just fiscal discipline on annual budgets, I'm all about transparency. And I would love for the Army Corps of Engineers and the uh, Harris County Flood Control District and other related agencies to tell us exactly the story of what happened and how it happened and why it happened. Now, when they're asked, they say, I'm sorry, we can't discuss this because we're a party to litigation. Yep. If they were a private litigant like BP was in the Horizon disaster or Exxon was in the Valdez disaster, I would certainly understand that. But those organizations have a much higher, broader responsibility to keep us all safe. And the way they keep us safe is to tell us what the truth, the facts are, well, including to look forward. So this litigation cuts both ways. Yeah, and, we, and we've learned some stuff that prior to some of the lawsuits being filed, and Jeff Linder came to Barry's group and, and mm -hmm. talked about some of those decisions. And I, I, you know, and I believe Jeff when he told me, because the Harris County Flood Control District was not part of the decision to open the floodgates, that was an Army Corps of Engineers decision. That was, that's exactly and, right. And the Corps made that decision, not because of the reasons most people think of that decision was made, it was because, and it was, Barry had alluded it, to a, a little bit of it is because water was spilling over the northern reach of the Barker, uh, mm -hmm. Barker yeah, Reservoir. Barker. <clears throat> and because it was spilling over that reach over there, they couldn't tr you know, control where that chute flow mm -hmm. and flooding was going to occur, and so they opened up the dam. Where was it going? Well, it was <clears throat> going all over those neighborhoods around Clay Road and flooding oh. areas that, that you know, they, they, it was never designed to do that, which was sure. one of the reasons why they opened up the, the dam. But I think a lot of those uh, uh, questions, but the big question I've had, and I'm a native Houstonian. Uh, I was born here. My father was born here. Um, we, uh, uh, I always knew that the Barker Reservoir and the Attucks Reservoir were places where I hunted 
and <laughs> and we you know rode motorcycles. We knew never to build a home there. And I'll never forget when I you know I saw the subdivisions being built. I went, how did they get permission to build in the annex and what you know I I you know it was in the back of my mind. And of course all that's going to be covered in litigation. And in that added to the flooding problem because you know as the as the water rose in the pools in the reservoirs the back side of those subdivisions were being flooded and it was kind of you know damned if you do damned if you don't you know you could not open the floodgates and they were going to flood or you open up the floodgates and flood memorial and i think the one of the most interesting comments that that uh, jeff linder made to barry's group and he was exactly right when Memorial flooded, you had a, a, a great big area along Buffalo Bio uh, in um, the Memorial area that had never flooded before. Right. Some very, very expensive yes, homes. Indeed. And those homes, as Jeff pointed out, they all, some of them, if they had flood insurance, they had a coverage of about $250,000 which wouldn't even cover the remodel of a kitchen in those homes. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's a huge problem. You've got government intervention where I really like Gary, uh, Barry's idea that, you know, the libertarian approach is, look, buyer beware, look on a topo map, look, you know, where you're buying your home. You know, think about where you're buying your home. I know everybody wants to live along Buffalo Bio and Memorial and Kincaid and, you know, even, you know, some of our greatest institutions, the jail, the, the courthouse are all built on Buffalo bio. Well, the bio floods. We know it floods. Stop doing it. And uh, the, uh, uh, in any, it, uh, you know, Jim said that he was uh, 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 in the real estate development business and so was I. And, and when I bought my home in Braisewood Place, I looked at a topo map before I ever bought it. I used to build in California and in relief and topo maps were everything. And I just pulled the topo map and decided to buy my home where I was based on elevation. Yeah. Wow. And, and, uh, but, uh, and it didn't flood. My neighbors flooded. I didn't flood. But, but uh, you know, all of this is important. And we, and we are actually misled by our government officials. We're misled by the real estate community who wants to sell homes. We're misled by a lot of different people. And in, in, in the biggest thing, I think, with our government officials, if you think about the areas that flooded in Memorial, in Braisewood Place, in Meyerland, you're talking about a huge property tax base that the government officials want to protect at all costs. They want the homes built back there because they like the value in the tax they're taking yeah, off of them. Yeah, I bet that is. Okay, Barry, you have a, I was gonna ask you another <clears throat> question too. You might wanna come in on that. And it's kind of a side issue, but do you view the uh, release of the water from the Attics Reservoir as a taking by the government? Well, I know that's a legal theory, and I, I, I'm sympathetic with it. I hope that's the case. I hope somebody compensates those property owners. I'd like to point out something about the, the federal matching process. Uh, governments like to rely on federal money. States do it. Local government does it. And they don't go forward with the project unless the feds have that money. <clears throat> and so and that's why uh, the Bray's project, which started in the mid-90s, in 97, I think, is ongoing and is predicted to take decades longer, according to what I read in the Chronicle, because the money comes so slowly from the feds for these matching funded projects. So there's no assurance that that Bray's Bayou project will be finished anytime soon. And as I pointed out before, you only get a 100-year flood protection from that project. So people should not be thinking, well, it won't be long before we, we're all protected from flooding. It's a $25 billion plan, so they don't have the funding, and when it starts to come, it can come very, very slowly. Okay, well, we're coming down to the <clears throat> last few minutes, and I'm gonna do a quick once around the table, and uh, you can give a thumbs up or thumbs down to the city's efforts to mitigate flooding with their uh, building restrictions and so forth, and the county's uh, $2.5 billion bond issue. Barry, which way are you going to vote on those two issues? Well, I think I see charades taking place at both the city and the county level, so I'll be voting down. Okay. Don? I'll, I'll, I'll vote for the county bond. I will vote against the rain tax for the city of Houston. Okay. Jim? Uh, I will vote no for both of them. Um, my uh, my concern about the city has been well expressed in, in, in many forums, including this one. Um, 
I'll also be voting no for the county. I'm very sympathetic for the idea of doing something, doing something significant, getting ready for things. But I would like to understand better what the plan is, et cetera. A, a larger concern that we haven't yet spoken about is every elected official I know says we don't have enough money, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough money. We always want to come and ask people to either sell bonds or, or increase taxes, et cetera. I would like to see us do a real zero-based budgeting analysis of the priorities under which we actually spend our money. If we want more money for flooding, let's stop wasting money on certain forms of public transportation like the <laughs> foolishness on the Post Oak uh, BRT transit. Okay, mm. Several hundred million dollars of just waste. Let's, let's figure out how we can use the existing money that we have okay. more effectively. Well, Barry, you're the uh, one, of, actually you and Jim both are uh, the two negative votes. What, uh, if somebody gave you a couple hundred million dollars to solve the uh, Houston flooding problem, or maybe more, what, what would you uh, recommend doing with the money? I would spend it on uh, publicity. And I would spend $200 million to explain to the public that the governments do not have answers and they cannot solve the flooding problem and they need to withdraw most of that taxing authority they currently use to protect themselves from flooding. So that $200 million would be an initial investment that would save billions of dollars in the future when the public realizes they've been misled in the past and they should not continue that, that taxing authority for that purpose in the future. Kind of makes me remember back to our uh, metro uh, issues where the city promised to end congestion yeah. on the freeways. Yeah. We yeah. just but by open. running around these huge empty buses that yeah, just exactly. clog up existing traffic. Okay. Don, you have any closing comments you'd like to make? No, I, I yeah, well, I guess I would encourage everybody watching the show, if, you, if you're home flooded or you have a relative that flooded, when the county is holding a uh, meeting in their area to discuss the, the projects, go to it. Those engineers need to hear from people about their local aspects on the flooding, and that's how they're getting information. Um, the, that information that's being gathered, and I've heard some of the engineers that work for the county said that they are getting good information from residents. Huh. And it, because, I mean, Houston is growing so fast, the county is growing so fast, there are all these little unique things that are causing certain areas to flood. And it's very hard to keep track of, and they need to hear from you. Okay, well, very good. Uh, I've got to wrap it uh, oh, now. We're wrap getting it. the signal, so uh, I'm hoping sure to have we'll, another... we'll get you on another. Uh, oh, that's all right. Another issue on thank that, you. but uh, thank you. Well, I want to thank all of my panel here. We're all thank native you. Houstonians. We all love this city, and we really want to see uh, the people that are living there protected in the right sort of way. And uh, I want to thank uh, HMS TV and our good friend producer there, Mark Pirtle, for uh, sponsoring and helping put on this show. And thank you all and hope we'll have you back in the future again. Thank David, you. thank you for the invitation. Absolutely.